Sandra Alvarez, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home right here in the UK. You are a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Genetics, Evolution and Environment at University College London, specializing in evolutionary biology and computational methods. You and your team have recently published a paper that's been very well received in the scientific community, a study that shines new light on evolutionary timelines, specifically when mammals made their first appearance on Earth. So, Sandra, this study took up four years of your life. Um, are you able to sit back now and enjoy all of the excellent feedback you've been getting? <laughs> so, hi, Mark. First of all, thanks for this nice introduction, and thank you very much for having me here. And, uh, well, actually, as we announced our paper just before the holiday season started, I definitely had some time to relax and get back to those who share their feedback with all of us, either via social media or by email. And uh, I must say that neither of us expected such a big impact on the thread that we shared on Twitter. Like, <laughs> I remember I was with my family back in Spain, and there was a moment in which, you know, we were all staring at my phone while we were having some dinner, and none of us had never seen the numbers increasing so fast in, you know, in retreat or likes before. And I, I, I couldn't really believe that so many people that I did not know were keen on our research and shared it in social media. So. That was totally unexpected. Well, before we get into the ins and outs of your study, let's just hear a little bit about your background. So where did it all begin for you and how did you end up here in the UK? And also, I have to add, co-authoring a study with previous Evolution Soup guest Angela Perry on dire wolves. So, well, everything started in Spain at University of Rovira in Virgili, and there I did my BSc in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And the thing is that even though I started with the idea of becoming a scientist working at the lab, I got quite frustrated with the lab practical sessions that I had during the first three years, uh, mainly because nothing would really work despite I was following all the protocols as if I was supposed to bake a cake. Um, but it was just then when I had a course in bioinformatics, I mm -hmm. then learned basic batch scripting and after running some basic bioinformatics analysis for some of the homework that I had to do for this course, then everything just worked. So I honestly got so excited with this that I just decided that I was going to focus my career on improving my computational skills. So then I moved to Sweden. Uh, there I did my MSc in bioinformatics at Hochschule in Hjöfte. And once I finished my master's, I was hired as a bioinformatician at the CTMR in Karolinska Institute, where I carried out my master's project. And well, I was there for three months. And then I moved to London to pursue my PhD in computational biology at Queen Mary University of London. And there it was where my passion for Bayesian statistics and evolutionary biology started. Because um, despite I knew how to code, like I had learned that uh, in the past in my master's and part of my uh, bachelor's dissertation, I had never applied my coding skills to phylogenomics or divergence times estimation analysis. So it was really a challenge that I had to face because I had to learn so many things that I mm. was not aware of before. Yeah. And it was actually during my third year when Dr. Lauren Franz invited us, like uh, my PhD advisor, Mario Torres and I, to join the research on direwolves that you have just mentioned, uh, which was led by Angela Perry. Yeah. And uh, my main contribution was the validation of the phylogeny inference and the divergence times estimation analysis. So apart from that, I also carried out some simulations to study the effect of the amination of ancient DNA when it is used in divergence times estimation analysis. Uh, but in general, this project was a huge collaboration with many researchers across the globe, so I was very happy to join this project. And, uh, and well, it was also during the end of my seven year when I started working on the MAMOS project that we are going to be talking about today, uh, which actually just finished last year while I was a postdoctoral researcher at UCL. So it took me four years of my life, like my last three years of my PhD and the first year and a half of my postdoc. 
Sandra, unlike most of my guests, you don't specifically study fossils or go out in digs or even work in a lab. The bulk of your research is done on computer. So can you give us an idea of how you work, what it involves, and what a typical day like is for you? Yes, so unfortunately my day-to-day -day is not as adventurous as going to the field and study different species or dig up queries or study different specimens at the museum. But I must say that I might not do this, but I do love working on my PC. And while I would not mind having an experience in the field, I would not trade my computational work or my day-to-day -day life for anything. So if I am honest, I do not really have a typical day because um, each day is different. Like some days, for instance, I might be teaching lab practicals uh, as part of undergraduate or master's modules. Other days, I am meeting collaborators to discuss the data I have been sent and how it should be better processed. Other days, I am attending seminars or lab meetings. And other days, I might actually spend more than 12 hours coding in front of my PC because I cannot wow. just bring myself to stop. Like, you know, when you are very concentrated on coding, there is nothing you can do to get you out of your PC. So, yeah, this, this is why I don't have like a typical day. But if I am to give an example, maybe I can talk a bit about my contributions to the projects I am normally involved in. So normally I do not collect the data, but uh, I either download it like from freely available databases such as um, Ensemble or NCBI, or I might be given the data by researchers with whom we collaborate. Um, then I will have a meeting with everyone involved in the project to decide how the data will be processed which questions we want to answer as part of the project, and then which analysis each one of us will carry out. And in my case, I'm normally assigned to deal with um, data curation, development of biopipelines, phylogeny inference, diversion sense estimation analysis. So everything that has to do with the technical part of the analysis, working just on my PC. And as this analysis demands lots of computational time, I cannot really use my PC, despite it is quite powerful, but you know, I just cannot. So instead I use what we call high computing clusters, which basically consist of many PCs, one connected to another, to which I can actually remotely connect and access. So once I'm connected, once I virtually access these PCs, I run my analysis in parallel, which reduces the amount of computation time substantially, which means that something that might take months or yeah, sometimes years, in my, if I were to run this on my PC, can be done in a month on a high computing cluster. So it's like a supercomputer. Precisely, that is it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, let's get into this massive and very important project published in Science Journal Nature at the end of 2021, a paper entitled A Species-Level Timeline of Mammal Evolution Integrating Phylogenomic Data. Now, this sounds quite complex and perhaps even intimidating to non-academics like myself. So can you give us an overview of what this project is about, how it came to be, and who was involved? So this project started in 2016 with Asif Tamuri, uh, Fabricia Nascimento, Robert Asha, Tihen Yang, Phil Donoghue, and Mario Dufres, with the aim to establish the most precise evolutionary timeline for mammals. At that moment, I was not involved uh, in the project yet. So Asif, who is the co-led author of the paper, was a researcher in charge of collecting the data for the two data sets that we describe in our paper, which consisted of a data set with uh, whole genomes for 72 mammal species, and a second data set with nuclear genes for around 5,000 mammals. So in order to do this, he developed a huge processing pipeline to source all this genomic data and to then identify poor quality samples or mislabeled data that had to then be removed. After that, Asif, Fabricia and Mario manually curated the alignments and phylogenies that were generated thanks to Asif's pilot which was actually a tedious and thorough process that took them several months. Mm -hmm. And um, in parallel, uh, Phil and Robert worked on the fossil calibrations that had to be used to calibrate to geological time the mammal phylogeny that was to be inferred at the end of the project. So in order for you to understand better what a phylogeny is, if you look at the phylogenies, we know 
which living species are related to each other, and which ancestral species they are related to, which are actually represented as nodes in a phylogeny. And we can also know how fast or how slow these speciation events occur by looking at the length of the branches. So when we want to know when these speciation events occurred, we can use the available fossil specimens of the ancestral species that we have in our phylogeny to build our calibrations. So in short, we use these calibrations as our prior information about the age of this node, which when we combine it with the genomic information in our Bayesian analysis, we will obtain our posterior, the estimated time for a given node in the phylogeny, which would correspond to the age that our method estimates these ancestors lived on Earth. So I won't really go into the details of how this algorithm works and is implemented in the software we use, uh, but I hope that this is good enough for now. Um, and then the software that we use, MCMC3, was developed by Zihen Yang, who implemented the code while we were working on this project because we required some new features when we were running analysis for model selection, as well as checkpoints. And what I mean by checkpoints is that sometimes when, when you use a high computing cluster, your job can be stopped if the cluster stops working which means that if you have been running something for several days and you're really looking forward to getting your results and suddenly this is stopped, you need to rerun everything from scratch and this is not funny. So if you have checkpoints, uh, this allows you to repeat your analysis from the last checkpoint that has saved like your analysis at that point, which is very good to have. And um, well, then uh, four years ago, it is when I joined the project with the M2 proceed with analyzing the data that had been already collected. So I could infer the mammal time trait. Uh, but before I did that, I had to further curate some of the data sets, which um, at the last stage, um, we like uh, Fabricia, Sif, Marion type, had the last check of all the phylogenies before we started doing the direction science estimation analysis. And then well, I was doing some preliminary analysis before assembling the, the, the big pipeline for the project and having to establish a protocol for the sequential Bayesian dating approach, uh, this method that we have reported in our paper, I realized that some of the calibrations had to be updated. So Matteo Batini and Phil Donaghy at that moment went through all the dubious calibrations and updating the uh, and actually updated all the calibrated phylogenies with mm. new fossil information. So by the end of the project, we had also another issue to deal with because we realized that some of the fossil calibrations we had been using had been updating uh, because uh, they followed the latest year of chronological updates. And this happened around September last year. So then <laughs> Robert Ash and Phil Donoghue were the responsible uh, for reviewing all the calibrations that we had used in the project. And then they had to update them following the latest yeah. updates. Which means that once we got this data, we had to repeat all the analysis again. But as the pattern was already said, it didn't take as long as it had taken before, which was very good. But yeah, we had to repeat everything again. <laughs> Gosh. And yeah. But well, uh, the last part of the project was carried out by Emily Carlyle, who downloaded all the fossil mammal data from the paleobiology database. And she instructed the age of first and last occurrence of each mammal genus after curating the downloaded data set and then use the results to track diversity through time. And the result of this analysis today is a part B in the figure that you have the whole mammal tree phylogeny uh, in our paper. Yeah. So that was mainly the whole process from the beginning to the end and all the different collaborators that have been um, making possible that this project finally <laughs> was finished. <laughs> It's quite a team, isn't it? It is indeed, and they're all so good at what they do that it was quite easy to collaborate with everyone. Like, even though we had a pandemic in the middle, we were able to, you know, communicate with each other and try to keep up with all the analysis as good as we could. The new method that you and your team use to discover the timeline of mammal evolution uses data gleaned from DNA and is much faster than the old style of number crunching that slowed the whole process down enormously. So can you give us an easy to understand explanation of the process and why it works so well? 
I will try my best. <laughs> so when it comes to the outline of our approach, I had to first establish a protocol based on a combination of various pipelines that I developed to efficiently process the data in a reproducible manner, which means that anyone following my instructions should be able to obtain the same results reported in our paper and infer the precise evolutionary timeline of mammals. But before I start going into detail, um, I would like to give a brief introduction of how the Bayesian approach works, as mm. some people might not be familiar with it, and I might be talking about something that people might not be able to follow. So the Bayesian approach that we use is based on the Bayes theorem, and there are three main paths that I will be focusing on. The prior, the likelihood, and the posterior. So the prior is a probability distribution that we specify for a particular parameter or parameters in our evolutionary model, which we are keen on estimating, because they are not known to us. And in our analysis, these unknown parameters are the divergence times of the species of our phylogeny, which if you look at the phylogeny or also a, a, a tree, what we call, uh, these are identified in the nodes of these phylogenies. And to build our priors, we will use the minimum and maximum edges established in the fossil calibrations that we have included in our phylogeny, our calibrated phylogeny, which remember that were based on the information that we gathered from the fossil record. So in that way, we can define our priors as probability distributions for each divergence time in our phylogeny. And the most important thing to remember now, before I continue with uh, the rest of the terms, it is that we are just using prior information that we include in our analysis to help the algorithm make a better inference for the divergence times that we want to unravel. Mm -hmm. So the better information we collect from the fossil record and the more accurate the fossil calibrations are, the better our posterior inference is going to be. So this is the definition of what we call the prior. So now we have the likelihood, which is defined as the probability of observing our data given specific evolutionary model and its parameters. So the first time that someone said that to me, I was just like, what? Like, I, I do not really understand what <laughs> likelihood is. Like, what do you mean by this definition? It was so complex that I couldn't really figure out what they meant. Like, you know, I, I can write likelihood, I can write the expression <laughs> in the mathematical terms, but I don't know what it means. So it took me a while to understand what the likelihood is, and it was not until I learned how to code it that I understood the concept. So if I were to explain now this with my own words, uh, I do it differently. For instance, like imagine that you are the algorithm in charge of calculating the likelihood. So to do this, you are told that even though you do not yet know your parameters of interest, like the divergence times in our case, you need to propose to suggest different values and use them in the evolutionary model to see what data you get. So you're going to propose values for the divergence times, say 80 million years ago or 79 million years ago or 81 million years ago for a specific node that corresponds to an ancestral species for one of the living species in your phylogeny. And you will do the same for the rest of the nodes, like one node after the other. Then, as now, I would know these parameters, like myself being the algorithm, I can now infer my observed data, which is the genomic data for my species. And as I know what my data are, because I am the one who has collected and filled the data, and I have given that before to the algorithm, mm -hmm. I can now see how good or how bad my estimation has been with my proposed value. So then according to how good or how bad it is, I will have a value, and this value is the likelihood. The larger the likelihood, the better it is going to be, the proposed value to estimate my observed data. So I hope that this has been you know, a good explanation of what the likelihood is, because uh, this is the only way that I manage to understand how it works. I hope that the same happens to you. <laughs> so the third term that I wanted to talk about is the posterior, which is the result of the Bayesian inference and what we actually really want to obtain at the end of the analysis. And in our case, this is the time tree with all the divergence times that have been estimated. 
So specifically, the resulting probability distribution for the posterior is a distribution that has been built based on all the different plausible values of the parameters of interest, in our case, the divergence times, that have been proposed and accepted during the Bayesian analysis, given the data that we have used, the genomic data, and the phylogeny with the fossil calibrations. And, well, like, some of you might be wondering why I have not mentioned the marginal likelihood. But I thought I could omit that, uh, and I didn't need to go into detail, uh, because this term is not calculated in a Bayesian approach. And thankfully it is not, because uh, this probability is very difficult to calculate, and if we really had to compute these, this analysis would be unfeasible. It would take a long time to compute. So to wrap up, now that I have introduced what the Bayesian analysis is and how it is based on, I am going to quickly go through the process of the pipeline that I built for our project, which is divided into two parts. So for the first part, I define four main tasks, mm -hmm. uh, curating the first data set with genomic data for 72 mammal species, then adding the fossil calibration to the fossil calibrations to the inferred phylogeny, then inferring the corresponding entry under this Bayesian framework, and then getting the estimated divergence times, and then I fit it onto them, skew t and skew normal distributions, uh, which I then use as prior distributions for the times that they would use in the next analysis. So this would be the first part, and for the second part, I had to create the second data set, which had nuclear genes for 4,705 mammal species. Mm -hmm. Then I divided this huge tree into 13 subtrees because otherwise the software would not be able to cope with it. Uh, then I had to add the fossil calibrations based on the literature and also these QT and SKU normal distributions that I had calculated in the first step. And then I just inferred the divergence times for each of the subtrees. So now I had a subtree inferred in the first part and a 13 subtrees inferred in the second part. So the last step was just to join the information that I got out of these two steps to generate the final mammal tree, the one that you see as part of uh, the figure in our main paper, the evolutionary timeline of mammals. So what was the team's conclusions about the rise of mammals? Uh, when did they first appear? So our main finding was that we can now confidently reject that modern mammal groups had a deep Cretaceous or a Paleogene origin. Instead, our results show that they originated after the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event, what we also refer to as the KPG event. So during the past two decades, um, there have been different studies that have been moving back and forth between post and pre-KPG diversification scenarios. And actually, the precise evolutionary time that we have estimated with our method settles this issue. And so far, I have not been sent any feedback or email against our new findings, um, although it is a very recent paper, and maybe some people are, are already drafting something that I am not yet aware of and I might see in the future. But at the moment, no news about that. <laughs> well, it's such an important discovery, and I want to congratulate you and your team for many years of hard work that will no doubt transform the world of the evolutionary research. So now that this is behind you, what's next? Um, what new projects can you tell us about? Well, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, well, now I will be further implementing and using the computational tools that I have developed as part of my PhD and my postdoc to infer evolutionary timelines with other species. But we still need to think which species we will first start with and how we will assemble both genomic and fossil data sets. But I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on these. And apart from that, I'm also part of site projects in which I see is building reproducible and user-friendly biopipelines in other fields, such as virtual screenings for drug development, primary and prop design, positive selection. So it is a bit of, yeah, various topics not connected with another but the main thing that i like doing is coding so that's why i'm part of these side projects to develop the bio pipelines i will leave links to your research and social media in the description below and all that's left to say is thank you once again sandra for coming on
to evolution soup thank you very much for having me mark it has been great talking with you and